but uh, I just want you to welcome my friend Saeed Hosseini and uh, <laughs> praise the Lord for what God's done in his life. And bear Thank in mind, I need you. a testimony. <laughs> you want this? Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not going to need that till very end. Okay. So, and I will need the help of the lady who set this up. I won't need it till for another, uh, until I get finished. It won't be for like three, at least three more hours. So. <laughs> well, you said quick testimony, so my message is going to be quick too. I want about, about three hours. How's that? <laughs> well, I know we've been sitting for a while. I know we've heard of lots of wonderful testimonies. We've taken uh, some extra time tonight. So I want you to just get re-energized, move a little, whatever you got to do, because good things are worth waiting, right? Nothing like uh, pumping your, yourself up in front of people. Huh? <laughs> but I just want to encourage you. There's a, a thread going on in everybody's testimonies from our president all the way to my brother who's not here that gave a testimony. Uh, you, you'll see as the message goes on. There's a thread in it that God had been ordaining. Right there, my brother right there. I loved your testimony. Right you, right, yes. I can't wait to get to know you better. So thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, Mario, our international president, and Michael, our national president, we honor you. We thank God for you and the great work that he has ahead of you. We know that the best is yet to come. Amen. Now, before I get started, I want to uh, recognize someone also that's been very instrumental in putting this meeting together. And that is my friend, Tim King. Without him, we would not be here tonight. I want to give, he has worked hard to put this together for two years. He's been talking about it. And I said, Tim, praise the Lord. When you don't know what to say, my pastor always says, praise the Lord. I didn't know how he was going to pull it off. So he did, and we thank God for you. And also for the book, that he was instrumental to publishing that book again a second time. So thank you for all, all your hard work. Also, uh, I want to recognize some friends that are here. My, my good friend David is here. Thank you for coming. Our armor bearers, Joe and Cecilia, both of them are here. So thank, thank you for coming here and, and honoring us and all the rest of you that have come here tonight. Uh, I saved the best for last. My, my beautiful wife, of, we just celebrated 39 years of marriage this couple weeks ago. My wife, Cynthia, thank God for her. She's my uh, partner in life, partner in ministry, business, my best friend, uh, the best part of me. So I, I thank God for you, for being here, putting up with me for 39 years. That, that's a full-time job right there. Some of you are wondering, a new year. We're coming into a new year. What kind of year is this going to be? By the way, Happy New Year. It depends on what you're expecting 2019 to be. What are you expecting? Are you a person of great expectation? Because whatever you expect, that's what you're going to get. If you're expecting great things, great things are going to happen. If you expect a little bit, a little bit's going to happen. If you're not expecting, guess what? Nothing's going to happen. Whatever you are expecting, you're setting yourself up because you are telling yourself, you better start believing what's coming out of your mouth. You better start believing. See, it's all, it all starts with believing. See, opportunity of a lifetime is ahead of us. But let me tell you something. The opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of that opportunity. I'll repeat that. Opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of that opportunity. There's a lifetime coming with this opportunity. And if we don't seize it, we're going to lose it. So how many believe that? 
My Father and my Lord, I just ask that you use me as your servant tonight. Speak the truth that you have spoken to me, that you have put in my heart. That you have shown me all these years. And how you can take a Muslim boy and bring him to America. And he would get married to a Mormon girl. And then we stand before you, praising you, giving you the glory and honor. Now, Father, all we have to do is believe and trust that you can use anyone. If you can use me, you can use anyone. So tonight, I pray you would let our expectations become so high that we would not leave the same person as we came here tonight. May you get all the glory, praise, and honor in advance. For truly, it's all yours, and it's not to be shared with any man. We pray these things in the mighty and powerful, glorious, wonderful, beautiful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And everybody said? Amen. Listen, a person of expectation realizes that there is a process. Example of the process that is found is in 1 Kings chapter 1844. You know the story. The prophet tells his servant, he said, I hear the sound of the abundance of rain, so I want you to go up to the mountain. I want you to check it out. The servant goes up there, and he comes back. He says, I don't see anything. He says, no, go up there. Goes up there again. I don't see anything. Go up there again. Seven times he goes up there. After the seventh time, he comes back. He said, you know, now I see a little... Looks like a little fist, a little hand up there. The prophet says, you better hurry up and get down the mountain before the rain comes in such a way where you know you won't be able to get down there. Guess what? Exactly what he said happened. See, what happened in this story is for us today, we can do the same thing. And we must have the ability, first of all, to hear the word of God. You heard the word of God. We hear testimonies tonight. You heard the word of God. Then the next thing is you must declare it. You must speak it. It's, not one, it's just enough to just hear the word of God. You got to declare it to the world. You got to declare it to people. You got to speak it out. Then you got to take action. And don't quit. Don't give up. You got to pray it in. There's a process. There's also a plan. You must go through the process and then do the preparation for the plan. See, as a leader, we must all become a people of expectation, great expectation. Next thing is we must be willing to yield to the process. Then we must develop a plan and then actively prepare ourselves for what God wants to do. Making fake declarations tonight. We must have patience, focus, faithfulness, perseverance, humility, and gratitude. That's why we heard tonight with these testimonies. Faith does what sight cannot. See, sight is the function of the eye, where faith is the function of the heart and your spirit. Because if you can see it, why do you need faith? If you can touch it, why do you need faith? See, a person of faith and expectation hears what no one else hears. This is what I want you to do with your business. They see what no one else sees. Oh, it's coming up there. There's a clouds forming up. Nobody else sees it. But the person of faith sees that. Then he starts declaring it. Hey, go up there. Keep going up there. Don't give up. Go up there. It's coming. I'm telling you, it's coming. Don't quit. He starts declaring it. When nobody else can see it or hear it or believe it. But that person doesn't give up. And then, finally, they're willing to do what no one else is willing to do. Step out. Be willing to look like a fool. Oh, I don't have the time to tell you the story about the prayer pavilion. Some of you had heard it. You're going to see it with your own eyes tomorrow, President Mario. But God just created something out of nothing. When nobody believed me when I said this is what God spoke on the mountain, but yet I held on. 
Listen, and it was 1987 when I was in Chicago, a businessman. Very successful, as Neil said. Had 15 Domino's Pizza restaurant. And I happened to start as a pizza delivery driver. That's how I started after graduating college. Talk about starting in the bottom. <laughs> Didn't get any lower than that. Then, once we had our stores, 15 of them, well, we were very successful. Success came very fast. Let me tell you, it's open store left and right, left and right. We had everything. Physically, materialistically, everything you could want, we had. But yet, I was walking around dead like a man dead on the inside. No purpose. No vision. Well, sometimes God gets our attention. He has a way of doing that. I was struck with an illness, long-term illness, a bedridden for months. What do you do in the middle of the night when you're up all night? You know, you can't even move. You got the TV going. You're watching. Man, I started to become a little religious watching TBN. God, touch me, heal me. I'll, I'll stop everything. I'll quit drugs. I'll quit everything. Help me. I saw this program, this man on TV, Demas Shakarian, was talking about the happiest people on earth. I'm like, man, I want to be one of these happiest people. I'm, the, I'm one of the miserable people. I want to switch. I want to become happiest people. So I called and ordered that book. Boy, I read that book so many times. I called and found out there was a chapter in Highland Park. First time I could walk with a cane. I walked up in that chapter, sat in the way in the back. I didn't want anybody to notice I was there because I'm like, okay, God, I'm here. But there was a prophet named Dick Mills. You, you in the red tie, stand up. Man, he read my mail. <laughs> he said, you've been running from God. God's calling you. He's trying to get your attention. You better stop running because he wants you. Man, after that meeting was over, they didn't have to come around. They used to come around and ask you, give you membership things. Man, nobody had to ask me. I was looking, where do I sign up? Where do I sign up? Because that became so clear to me that God was getting my attention through that sickness. Everything was put together. Get the book. Read the book. I mean, all the stuff started coming together. Then I joined for many years. Started in the bottom again, serving, like Maria said, serving, water, whatever it was, I did. Next thing you know, we, you know, kept becoming this, that, treasurer, that, whatever. So finally became the president of the chapter. For many years, until 19, I'm not sure, 1994 or something like that, and Neil was part of that chapter. I lost touch with the fellowship after I moved here to Phoenix from Chicago. That era was the era where Demas Shakarian had passed. And there was a lot of division in the fellowship. There was a lot of things going on that was not good, was not from God, I should say. And I refused to take sides. So when I moved over here, I kind of lost touch. Folks, did you realize last time Full Gospel Businessmen had a national or international meeting in Phoenix it was 1998. 21 years ago. I attended that as a businessman. My friend Neil Nellis, which we had kept in touch, the only one that I stayed in touch with, called me, said, we're in Phoenix. You moved to Phoenix. Why don't you come to the meeting? And I came to the meeting. My pastor, Pastor Tommy Barnett, was the keynote speaker. Now, tonight, I'm the keynote speaker. What? What? How did that happen? How could that be? The only God can do something like that. How could that be? You start serving water, now you're the international president? Only God can do that. Okay? But it took hearing. It took seeing, it took speaking, and then doing, doing, working, serving. No limits. P.D. Barnum said this. He said, a man's station is only limited by his imagination. So if you can imagine it in your mind, 
if you can see it, if you can hear it, if you start declaring it, it's going to happen. Listen, it, and it takes transition into the new norm of realities. God's given us a new norm for this fellowship. Okay? There's going to be changes made. There's going to be changes made in the, in the way we conduct our meetings, in the way we do things. Excellence is going to be the word. Excellence. Excellence in every area. Excellence in timing. Excellence in when we give testimonies. Quick, short to the point. Okay? When we do things, when we say we're going to have you here from this hour to this hour, we're going to stick to it. Okay? I get testimonies all the time. I want to give you quick, quick lessons on those of you who give testimonies or take testimonies. Never give the mic to the person who's taking the testimony. I learned this from my pastor. The person standing over here, you hold the mic. Okay, Brother Joe, tell us about what God has done. And Brother Joe has already been talked to. I want you to be quick to the point. Two minutes maximum. One minute, 30 seconds, whatever time you got. And then when the Brother Joe starts to go you go back, okay, tell us now, because he already told you what the testimony is, the key point, what that is. Tell us now. So you move things along. I threw that in for free. <laughs> That's the transition into a new norm, okay? We got to move with the times. When God shows up, okay, those who are the early adopters receive it because they have been what? Expecting and they've been waiting on God. They've been declaring what God has told them, his promises. And they have been preparing for his arrival. Ah, they come into the meeting. They prepare the room. They walk around. Praise God. They, they anoint the places. They make sure everything's worked. The sound works. They like everything. Excellence. Because what? The king is coming. Let me tell you, if the president was coming tonight, would we have done this, things differently? If the king of... Some country was coming tonight. Well, we've done something differently. Yes, we have. But there's protocols. Listen, if we have to have protocols into getting into the presence of the earthly king, how much more protocols do we need to do to get into the presence of the king of kings and the Lord of lords? Excellence is the word. Excellence is the word. Excellence is the word that's going to be repeated. And we must go to the experience of Pentecost. We'll talk about that. Then it happens suddenly. Suddenly. We all love suddenlies, don't we? Come on. Don't we all love suddenlies? But sometimes God takes a long time before he moves suddenly. Sounds like an oxymoron, but it's not. Because the time that he's taking is preparation time to get you prepared for that suddenly. Because if he got you in there 24 years ago, you weren't ready. I wasn't ready 21 years ago. See? See? But when God has moved, if I could tell you what God has done since September of this past year till now, it'll blow your mind away. He's moving so suddenly we can't even keep up with it. But it took 21 years. It takes a long time. What God is doing now, he's accelerating things and acceleration by association. People, connections. He's going to connect you. We heard testimonies. I don't know who said it. They met somebody. That met some, that knew somebody, that knew somebody. Connections, godly connection that he had prepared already. Divinely ordained by the Holy Spirit because he knows the plans that he has for your life. And he has been preparing, he's been talking to you. He's been, you've been seeing things. And you've been holding on to him, believing and trusting. So now at the right time, in the right place, the right person, boom, suddenly is going to happen. Are you ready for it? See, while God's been preparing you and taking you by going through the process, he has been doing the same thing with others and the people in the other parts of the country and other parts of the world. And with one connection across the world, you're going to meet one person that's going to catapult your vision and your dream to the level that God wants it to go. Harvest field. Harvest field is ready. The harvest is ready. Jesus looked and cried. He said, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. That's what he said. He said it back then. How true is it now? How true is it now? I'm here to declare to you a new season of multiplication, restoration, and redemption. I did not hear one amen on that one.
Multiplication, restoration, and redemption. See, the devil wants to stop. He wants to stop it if you let him. How's he going to do that? By bringing division, bickering over menial things, or pride, or hurt feelings, personal agendas, titles, whatever. Oh, I got to be whatever. No, no, no. The greatest among you are the least the servants. That's what Jesus said. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. That's where you start. And God sees that. He's like, man, you're such a good servant. I'm going to promote you. The devil doesn't want unity. 1 Peter 5 8 says, be sober, sober, vigilant. The devil, like the roaring lion, he's roaring around looking to see who he may devour. Who he may devour. Some people quote the scriptures improperly. They say, the devil is running around rolling whom he can devour. That's not what it says. Whom he may devour. He needs your permission before he can devour you. Did you know that? And if you give him permission, he will devour you. But if you can tell him, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> you have no power. Greater is he that's in me than anything that's in the world. He needs your permission to devour you. And unfortunately, a lot of people have been given permission. Yes. See, his plan is to subtract and divide. And then conquer through confusion, offense. Thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. John 10.10. 10. But God says this. But he said, but I have come to give life and give it more abundantly. The devil has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life. Proverbs 18, 16 says, a man's gift will make room for him. A lot of people are trying to make room for their gift. That's why they're looking for titles. Very quiet in here. I'm not looking at anybody in here. A lot of people <laughs> over there are looking for titles. Listen, for the last six years, by divine connection, Again, I got to be real close for the last six years, my wife and I, with Richard and Vanji, by association, again, of my old friend, Neil Nellis. They were here in town, I don't know, some seven, eight, ten, eight years ago. And he had told them about the prayer pavilion. They came on the one Tuesday night that we were in New Zealand. So we didn't come back until Wednesday the next day. So I told them, they went to the prayer pavilion, they saw it, and then we met them in the Hilton, by the way, Hilton, whoa, Tapatia in Phoenix. He sat there for hours, hours. I'm not kidding you. You remember that, Neil? Listening to my story, listening to my testimony, listening. Then he was so interested, and he asked me to send a thing, and they published it in one of the uh, voice magazines. By the way, if you want it, they're out of print. I have a few. I will give $100 per, per copy if you want. That's how good it is. Just kidding. He became like a spiritual father to, to us. We spent hours in his home. About four years ago, I started to ask Richard, you know, you're getting up in age. It's time to name a successor. Have you thought about that? Oh, yeah, I have a few people in mind, this and that, and whatever. I said, listen, <laughs> I'm not asking you this because I'm looking for it. First of all, if you offered it to me, I'll, I'll run because I don't want it. I gotta, God's called me something else. So I'm not asking for personal agenda. Do you have a successor? Yes, he said, I have two or three people. I said, who's your number one? Without hesitation, he said, Mario. It's been told that there can be no successful organization without the right successor. Who's your first choice, Richard? Mario. Then I said, why don't you announce it now? Announce it so everybody will know. Let's have a nice, nice transition. What if? I said, what if something happens to you, Richard? He said, God will take care of it. This is God's ministry, fellowship. He'll take care of it. And he sure has. Because 
God has raised up our international president. God has put him here. See, God, the Lord showed me, if I had done it, if Richard had done it, then people would have said, Richard favored him. That's why he did it. But he said, this way, everybody's going to know that I did it. That's why. See, God is the one who raises one and puts one down. Mario, God has chosen you. You're his man. You're his chosen vessel to lead this fellowship into the next chapter, into the next hemisphere of what God has. The greatest leaders are the greatest servants. And you heard. <laughs> Serve water. And he saw what God did. Oh, I heard yesterday what happened. Does everybody know what happened yesterday? With the, is it a secret? Can I share? Our international and national president gathered all the people that were part of the fellowship, but the leaders, and they washed their feet. Wow. That's humility. That's doing what Jesus did. He washed the disciples' feet. And one of them said, no, I don't want you to do it. He said, listen, you can't have a part of me if you don't let me do this. See, Proverbs 16, 7 says, when a man's way pleases God, even his enemies will be at peace with him. You want your enemies to be at peace with you? Just start pleasing God. Forget pleasing man. You please God and you please man in, in, in the process. Listen, full gospel businessmen's fellowship international, we're moving into a new season. Okay, new season. With every new season that comes, some leaves fall off the tree, but new ones come out. Okay? It's okay. We're going to lose some leaves. Or we're going to have a lot more leaves coming up. So you decide for yourself. You want to hang in there? Because things need to change. Things will change. Our president is already doing it. 30 years ago, we heard testimony. Somebody gets up here 30 years ago, God this. 20 years ago, God did that. That's fine. That's wonderful. But what did God do last week? What's he doing today? What did he do last month? Listen, if you have to search too far, go back too far to have a testimony that means either your God's been asleep or you haven't been seeing or hearing or being doing what he wants you to do. Because he'll give you a fresh testimony all the time. New, now, present, past was wonderful. That got our start. I love that demonstration. Present is where we are today. But we don't want to stay in the, we certainly don't want to stay in the past. And we don't want to get stuck right where we are today. We're marching forward to the future. Because that's what the future is. That's what God's calling us to do. God is a progressive God. He's a visionary God. He's an ever-moving forward God. He wants to do a new thing. He wants to put a new wine in the new, in the new wine skin. Is your wine skin ready? Because if it's not, you need to get it prepared. Have you been hearing? Have you been seeing? Have you been declaring? Have you been preparing yourself? For the new wine. Because if God puts a new wine in the old wineskin, it's going to get wasted. It goes up. It just. Pfft. So you got to prepare your wineskin. You got to prepare yourself for that new oil that God wants to do. And you know, the greatest threat to the new move of God that he wants to do in this fellowship are those that were on the front line of the last move of God 30, 40 years ago. Because they want to stay there. They're embracing the past. Well, God did this, we had this, we had 12 testimonies, we had, well, well, wait a minute. We need to move with the times. The past is our heritage. It's wonderful. It's great. The present is where we are today. The future is where we want to focus on. If we want to, if we want to get new people into the fellowship, we need to move with times. We need to move, we need younger people here. We need young people in the fellowship. And our old format is not going to attract younger people. I'm sorry. Changes are coming. Get ready. Get ready. And don't, don't be like one of those who are going to be stuck because you were on the front line of the last move of God. Guess what? You can be in the front line of the new move of God to change your disposition, change your mindset. Okay? 
What God did in the past was great. But what he's going to do now, eyes not seen, ears not heard, neither has it entered in the heart of man those things that God has prepared. So don't stay in the past. Future. Yeah, your young people are clapping. And I'm one of them. It hurts me when you laugh like that. Listen, it's time to put our differences aside. Put our agendas aside. It's time to reconcile. I'm going to be ready for that video in a few minutes. So whatever we need to do, we need to do it. It's time to put our differences aside. Get ready. Get ready. Prepare. Hear. Put your ear. See, at all times, you should have one ear to hear, to our world, one ear to the Lord. What is God saying? What are you hearing from voice of God? What are you hearing? There's so many voices coming at us from so many different directions. We need to sit quietly, have some quiet time to hear what the Lord is saying. To see the vision that he wants to give to us. And start believing and declaring it. Not yet. Thank you. Oh, you're quick. See, I used to, I'm supposed to, usually I have to give them 10 minutes and they're still not ready. You're good. This is one of the young people right here. Okay? When you ask them to do something, boom, done. This is what we need more of. Thank you. You made me look bad now because they looked like I wasn't ready. Looked like I wasn't ready. But I'm going based on the past. I need to get out of the past and start thinking about the future. And this is the future right here. Reconciliation, it's time. It's time to put our differences. His kingdom come, his will be done, not my kingdom. Too many people are building their own kingdom. Nobody in here, everybody over there, over there. They're all building their kingdom. Is reconciliation even possible? It started last night, foot washing. Forgive me. See, I put, I put her under too much stress. Now she can't find it. I messed up. No personal. Listen, 1 Corinthians 2.4 says this. Paul said, my preaching is not with many words, but demonstration of the power. No personal agendas. This is what God wants for us. John 17. Go read that. One. We need to be known as those who are One. Jesus said, this is how they know your mind. By the love that you have for one another. Do you see the thread of what I've been talking about? The thread that's been going on through this whole message of what everybody's been sharing? Healing for the nations is what God is going to use. This ministry. This fellowship. Healing for the nations. And I want to show you this video when they're ready. No, no, it's okay. I have to prepare it. In year 2012, the Lord, by divine connection, again, by divine favor, put me in connection with Thomas Trask, which was the head of the Assembly of God worldwide. He was supposed to go. They had invited. You can hold it right there. That's good. That's good. Don't play it yet. They were, they were having... Nash Global Day of Prayer for the poor and needy, praying for people. And it was on 12-12-12. They had chosen 12 people to go. And I was, again, by God's favor, was chosen to be one of them. Well, it so happened that Thomas Trask, a week before, called me and he said, um, my wife had a heart attack. She can't, I can't go. I have to stay home. Would you go in my place and take my spot? Whoa. Okay. Now, because he was the leader, all of a sudden, he wants me to take his place. I said, okay, I'll go. God did such an amazing thing. The night before we went to Israel, I had this dream. It scared the daylights out of me. I had this dream that I was in a church, and I was asking forgiveness of this Jewish man in Israel. 
And I thought, how could that be, God? How could this be? Well, when we went to Israel that night, I had the same dream again. It scared the daylights out of me. So we showed up. We went there. It was our last thing. And I, they told me, they gave us our things what to pray for. I was the number 12. <laughs> we took 12 people with us. We have one of them here tonight with us. That went. My wife went. And I was number 12. Everybody, first one had pray for clean water, pray for clean air, pray for food, pray for housing, pray for this, that, the other. And I look at mine. They didn't give it to you what it was till you sat down. Mine was healing for the nations. I'm like, oh, Lord. My heart now is, is jumping out of my chest. I looked at the person who was in charge, the assistant, and I said, this is not on the agenda, but the Lord had put something in my heart. He wants me to do Do you trust me to do this? He said, yes. Thomas Trask, trust you. Trust you fully. Go ahead and do it. And this is what happened. Hallelujah. Healing for the nations. How many of you know that our world is in need of healing. It's in a mess. The government has failed us. Our money, our gold and silver has failed us. Even religion has failed us. But you know, there's one that never fails us. And that's Jesus Christ. Psalms 107. 20, it says, he sent his word and he healed them. All we need is to hear one word. The right word spoken by the mouth of the Holy Spirit into our ears. Tonight we have heard some wonderful, beautiful prayers. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 that the kingdom of God is not of words but it's of power and demonstration of the power I want to ask my brother Caleb to come up here would you stand over here you know there could be no healing Unless first there is reconciliation. And before reconciliation, there needs to be forgiveness. Before forgiveness needs to be repentance. And somebody needs to start repenting. I am the most unlikely person to be standing up here among these wonderful men and women of God. But God knows what he's doing. <laughs> 12, 12, 12. Special day. An ex-Muslim born in Iran in Jerusalem asking forgiveness I want to stand as a representative of Iranian people, Iranian government, Muslim people in general, Arab people in general, and I want to ask you to forgive me. Would you do that? Now we can have reconciliation. I feel like uh, I feel like now that you've uh, asked for forgiveness, that it would be appropriate for you to uh, pray for me as a representative of the Jewish people. I just want to get down on my knees and ask you to pray a blessing over us as a people. Father, I just thank you for this privilege that I have 
to be standing next to my brother. Lord, we are brothers. Even from thousands of years ago. Isaac and Ishmael. Reconciled. I pray for my brother. And I thank you God for this privilege that I can stand in this holy land next to my brother. And I pray that a special blessing upon him. I pray a special anointing upon him, Lord. That Father, there will be such a power and the fire of the Holy Spirit upon him that you would truly give him the favor of God in whatever he does and whatever he touches. That Lord, people, when they see him after tonight, they will see something upon his face, in his eyes, that there will be a fire. There would be something that they would say, what's different about you? And Lord, that you would truly enlarge his territory. Bless him and enlarge his territories. That you give him the desires of his heart, that you would bring him the Jews and the Gentiles, the Arabs, all who would come into his path. And Lord, that you would truly bless him. Bring the provision for the vision that you have given to him. To reach out to the lost, to those that are needy, God. And we just thank you for this momentous occasion right now. If God can do that, is there anything too hard? We're coming up with a season that we're going to see far greater things than what you just saw. So don't give the devil a foothold. Hear what the Lord is saying. See his glory revealed. Speak and declare his promises and his miracles. And then go out there and do his work while we still have time. Listen, that story I just told you earlier about 1 Kings chapter 18. Same thing happened on the day of Pentecost. Think about it. Same process. They were gathered, waiting, believing, trusting. They didn't know what they were waiting for. They were just waiting on the word of God. Then they heard. They heard a sound. <laughs> Ooh. Then they saw. They saw fire. Then they spoke. And then they went out, and 3,000 was added to the church in one day. Same process. Hear, speak, okay? Declare. Do. Because he's not going to get done. Unless God shows it to you and you see it and you all that. If you don't get out there and do it, it's not going to get done. See, God is raising a new level of Christians. I like to call it a new hybrid. You all know what a hybrid is, hybrid car. It has electric and gas. Sometimes it uses electric. Sometimes it, needs, it uses gas. God is using a new hybrid Christians. Revelation 5.10 says, And he made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That's a promise from God. It didn't say kings or priests. He said kings and priests. We have the authority and the ability, God-given authority, to be both. Now, we're going to be stronger in one area than the other, but God's going to give you the ability and, it, and knowledge to hear, to see, to speak, and declare, and wait. Prepare yourself in the process. When he tells you to put your kingly hat on, you go out there, you bring the provision for the vision. When he tells you to put your priestly hat on, he gives you a vision. You can do both. And that's the new kind of hybrid that God is raising. Listen, two things are going to get people's attention real fast. I guarantee you, if you brought 20 Muslims in here, okay, and they saw a miracle, <laughs> they have no questions anymore. I'm telling you, that's how I got saved. 
I heard when they gave a message in tongues, I heard it in my language, and I had no questions after that. I knew he was real, okay? But God wants to do miracles unlike anything we've ever seen before. Number one is miracles. The other one is money. Money and miracles are going to get people's attention. And money is going to get you into the doors where you were not able to go before. You get into boardrooms. You get into places. You get into offices, government offices, places, because you went there as business. And then all of a sudden you open your mouth and God will put your priestly hat on and people would get saved. And let me tell you, we've been going after too many small fish. It's time to go after big fish because if you go after the president, the CEOs of the companies, you get that one person, you got hundreds, you got thousands of employees. Because when they see the leader change, they go, what happened? What happened? Who was the gentleman that said went home and the wife said, what happened to your face? Oh, it was you. It was our leader. Yeah. Look. What happened to you? Successful businessman, God changed it. Look what he's done not through him. Wow. And he's just getting started. He's just getting ready started. Matthew 3, 11. Somebody else talked about John the Baptist. He said, I'll come up, prepare the way. This is where John the Baptist is talking about. He said, hey, I need baptize you in water. Unto repentance. But he said, there's another one coming. that I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. He will baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire. Oof. Why did he just, why did he say Holy Ghost? Why, why isn't that enough? But let me tell you, you got to have the fire. Because if you don't have the fire, you forget about the Holy Ghost. You got to keep the fire going. Okay. When God gives you a vision, you talked about, I don't know again who it was, so many wonderful testimonies. Somebody said about God gave them a vision, they, they, they just, the vision just wouldn't, wouldn't go away. See, when God gives you the vision, when he had us go from business into ministry to transition, I didn't want to do it. I ran from it for a year, but God, <laughs> long story, took me around. Finally, I said, okay, God, I'll do it. Then when we came here to Phoenix and he gave a vision for that prayer chapel, I'm telling you, I try to put it down so many times and walk away from it. See, when God gives you a vision, you can put it down and you can walk away from it. But every time you turn around, the vision is looking, staring right at you. You give up the vision, the vision picks you back up. That's what has happened to so many people. Change lives. Like it's not about things. It's about souls. See, there was a man in the Bible. His name was Jeremiah. God gave him a, a vision, a great big vision. He was very young. He said, I want you to go out and I want you to preach and I want you to rebuke those people. Imagine this. God tells you, you're, a, you're, you're just a junior pastor. I want you to go in front of Assembly of God International and I want you to rebuke them. Tell them what they're doing is wrong. Imagine that. But that was his task. So I paraphrase. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. He said, Lord, every time I bring your word up, it causes problem. Everywhere I bring you up, it causes problem. I don't want to do this anymore. So I'm just going to put it down. I'm not going to bring you up anymore. But this is what it said in the... Verse 9, it says, every time I try to put the vision down, the vision picked me up because the word of God was so deep in me, it shot out of my bones like a fire. The word of God is fire. This word has fire, Holy Spirit and fire in the word of God. But let me tell you, this fire for it to burn, it needs fuel. And you have a choice. You can put it out anytime you want. But then... In order for it to burn, it's going to need fuel. Because this is going to run out in a few seconds. What is the fuel that will keep the fire going in you when the word starts speaking to you? Prayer. Fasting. Hearing from God. Spending time with God. Giving you vision. 
trusting God, having faith to move, when nobody else is willing to do it. Listen, if God has given you a task, he will give you the ability, he will give you the, if he's given you a vision, it's his problem to bring the provision. It's not yours. So make sure you get a vision from God. He'll bring the provision. Brother Mario, you were there five years ago. I had a heart. I got to tell you the story about this before I do that. About 2011, a friend of mine named Pastor Leo Gazic was on staff with me. He was my prayer partner. He was one of my mentors. I learned so much from him. Unbelievable. We were on staff together. Lovely guy, my age. He was going to Africa. He went there to Uganda. He, by the way, the first time I went to Uganda with him, God changed my life. And that's a different story. But he had gone to Uganda. He was going to Uganda. And uh, he came over before he went there, and we would pray together. And my wife was doing an illustrated sermon, Carriers of the Flame, the following week. So I was telling Leo about it. We were praying about it. My wife happened to call while we were talking. I always take her calls. I better, right? So I picked up the phone, and Leo talked to him and prayed for her. I said, that's great. So after it was over, he said, you need to use my fire Bible for that, carriers of the flame. I go, what is that? He went home and grabbed his fire Bible. He had just used this one time. He just gotten it. Of course, he couldn't take it with him on the plane. So he said, use this. I said, how long can I keep it? He said, keep it till I come back. Well, the story doesn't end there because he never came back. He was in Africa after preaching to 5,000 people. 5,000 people. <laughs> they were going from, Af from Uganda to, I think, Tanzania or one of those countries next to it overnight. And if you have been to some of those countries, back roads in Africa, you take your life in your own hand. I mean, it is, they're narrow. There's not street lights like we have here, and they're, they're, they're highways. So five people were in the car, and they were passing. They, they were started to pass this bus. They realized there was another car coming, so they came to come back, and they got sandwiched in between that bus and a truck. Boom. Five pastors went into eternity just like that. Well, the news came. All of us were devastated. I cried. I cried. I said, God, why did you take my friend? He was my age. He was young. He was fruitful. Look what he was doing. He was working for you, 5,000 people he just preached to. Why? God said some things you never understand. But listen to what he told you. He said, keep this till I come back. He was telling you something. He was telling you, keep the flame burning. Don't let the flame go out. So I took on that mantle. And I, everywhere I go, I preach. I use this. And I tell the story. Because I've had, that's what God wants to do. So five years ago, the Lord put it on my heart to get, and it was a very difficult to find. So don't ask me where I got this. I'm not going to tell you. The Lord put it on my heart to get some of these. And then in the international convention in 2014, he had me give it to Richard and Vanjie as a gift. How many of you remember? Some of you were there? Any of you were there? Yeah. When Richard passed, I asked Vanjie if she had that. She said, yes. I said, can I have it? She said, yes. So I got it back. President Mario, I want you to come here. See, I told you it's going to need fuel. And you thought this was a magic trick. No, it is, it's just a Zippo lighter fluid. <laughs> I'm giving you all my tricks here. The reason I'm doing, see, God always does this. He just saw how it went out because I didn't prepare. What I want to do is what I did with Richard. I want to light this. And I want you to open yours. Open it up. With the same 
power. You now pass the flame for the nations. This has been passed to you. This is now being trusted to you as a successor of this fellowship. Stretch your hands out towards them. Father, we just anoint this man, this gift from you that you have given, not only to us, to our nation, but the nations of the world. And he has heard you. He's spoken. He's yielded. He, had, he has waited. He has served. And he has trusted. Now, this is the hour. This is the season. Now, you're going to tell him, I'm taking you now to be the ambassador for the healing for the nations. You started here in Phoenix. Now you're going to be the ambassador that's going to take this healing around the world, around the nations. And he's trusting you now with this, to take the flame around the world. God anoint him, put a hedge of protection around him, wherever he goes, bless his family, his children, put a guard around him, his businesses. Father, we pray that you would bring so much provision because there is great vision. There is so much vision in him. And he's going to trust you. For the provision, not to man. He's not going to look to man for, for provision, but he's going to look to you, and he's going to teach the rest of the world how to keep their eyes on the Lord. And everything that they need will come to pass. So use him, God. Use him, God. In a new and powerful way, we pray. We put him in your hands. Use him, God. In the name of Jesus. You know, the Lord didn't even show me that until two days ago as I was preparing for this. I said, now, successor. There it is. One, fire. But one word of advice to you. Don't take that on the plane with you. <laughs> mail it ahead of time. That's what I do. I mail it ahead of time. It's waiting for me when I get there, and I have a mail it back to me. You might be able to get away from it because your name is Garcia. But me, Hosseini, oh, I, I can't take that chance. They're like, get over here. We got interrogation. We, are you the shoe bomber, the underwear bomber? What is this now? You're the Bible bomber? God bless you. Love you. Listen, it's fun. It is fun to serve the Lord. We don't have to be all fuddy, old fuddy duddies and, and oh, holy Lord. No, we can laugh. We can. Christians should be the happiest people on the earth. Oh, name of the book. Check that out. I just came up with that. We should have a second printing on that one. It's amazing the things you say when you're under the anointing. It's right? just amazing. Listen, I want to tell you about a fresh testimony, and I'm almost done. Only got another hour and a half. <coughs> Fresh testimony. A few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, at the latest, I don't know, it was less than that. My wife and I went to dinner. While we were at dinner, I got a text from one of our deacons at the church that said, hey, my uh, nephew's in the hospital. OD'd on heroin. He's been brain dead for two days. Could you pray for him? Sure, I'm sure I'll pray for him. You want me to go visit him in the hospital? I'll go tomorrow. When I dropped my wife at home in the driveway, the Lord said, you better go now. So I went to the hospital. And I declared. Something came upon me when I went in that hospital. He was laying there dead as a doornail. The mother was standing there crying. They had just brought her papers to sign for donor, organ donors. That's the last stage. Okay. They want, she's like, they want me to sign this paper. I said, no. I walked in that room and I could smell death. I could literally smell death. Something came over me. I started praying. I started taking authority over that death. I started talking to that. Michael, you're not going to die. You're going to live. I know your spirit can hear me. You tell your spirit right now. You're going to live. You're not going to die. Tell the devil he's a liar. He can't have your life. God has a plan. I just, I don't even know what I said. I just started declaring the word of God, the power of God. Fire of God came out of me. And I took authority over death. I said, next time I see you, you're going to be sitting up. As God is my witness, 
They called me the next day. Said he's he's up and he's running around. He's going crazy. He wants to leave. He wants to go back to the drug house. The cops are here. They're they're holding him back and all that. So I said, okay. I went there and I saw him. He was laying and and laying in bed, like a baby position. They said he didn't want to talk to anybody. He's bad because the cops won't let him go anywhere. So I walked in there. I said, Michael, how you doing? He heard my voice. See, he was out. He heard he heard my voice. He sat up in bed. We start talking. I said, how you doing? I started talking to him. Anyway, make a long story short, I went back two more times. The third time was a Sunday morning when I went there. Um, I ended up talking to him, leading him to the Lord, telling him how tired he was from running. I mean, he just told me with his own words, I'm so tired of living like this. Let, led him to the Lord, okay. And he, on the way out, I said, Michael, God's got great plans for your life. Wow, I'm so excited. I said, how old are you, Michael? He said, 33. I said, I have a son. Almost 40. You're old enough to be my son. Hey, can I adopt you? The man started crying. He started crying, grabbed me and hugged me. Like, I'm like, wow. His mother told me I thought he's had a really bad relationship with his father. Never had any love. That boy, the next Sunday, was at church with us before serv- between the services. And he was on his way to L.A. Dream Center to the drug rehab. We just heard that he is doing wonderful, he's going for the second term, and he's reading the Bible, he wants to be a preacher. Listen, God is doing miracles. Unbelievable. Do you believe he wants to use you to do those? Listen, Bible says in Matthew, many are called, few are chosen. Why? Why is that? I ask God, why are you so picky? You choose a few. He said, it's not me. I call everybody who wants But many are not expecting, and they don't prepare. Therefore, when the call comes, they either don't hear the call, they don't see it, don't want to see it, they don't want to have a vision, they don't want to declare by faith, and if they do all of that, they're not willing to do the work. That's why few are chosen. So let me ask you this. Who is ready for the call of God? Wanting to be God's new hybrid, a king and a priest. If that's you, I want you to stand to your feet. King and a priest. That's for men and women. Listen, every king needs a queen. Okay? And if your husband is not treating you like a queen, perhaps you're not treating him like a king. Because in every king... In every man, there is a king and there is a fool at the same time. The one you speak to grows. So if your husband is acting like a fool, start talking to him like a king. God wants to use the women in this fellowship just as well as the men. Not leaving anybody out. Now I have three gifts we have for everybody here tonight. I want to tell you what they are. And when you come up, uh, when you, you don't have to come up. We don't have a line. I will just do it right here. I want to pray the prayer of Jabez over you. We have prayed this prayer over ourselves for the last eight years. And God had me make these cards, the prayer of Jabez, and left the name blank. So you put your name. And Neil called upon the name of the God and said, bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. God wants to do that for you. And on the back of it, 10 people in the Bible that experience living in the favor of God. We have a gift for you for all of these. The next thing that we, I want to give you, we have prayer cloths, anointed prayer cloths, just like the ones Michael got, the one on heroin, that we want to give to you for those who need healing. The next thing I want to give you, this is a 40-day prayer channel cha- cha- challenge. 40-day prayer covenant. I just got these. I got a 1,000 of these to give out next Tuesday for when we have our first Tuesday night service in the auditorium. We're going to expect about seven or 800 people. I want to, what this says is you make a covenant. You find a friend that you make a covenant with that for, for the 40 days, you're going to pray for him. He's going to pray for you. And you don't stop there. You keep adding on to it. So you're going to have a circle of people that are going to be in covenant with you to pray for your vision, for the provision, for this ministry, for whatever it is that you want from God. How many are ready for that? How many are ready to be God's hybrid? Raise your hands right now. 
Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. You see the hands. They've heard. Now, as they are contemplating, as they pray over this God, show them. Give them a vision. Let them see what they have heard. Father, help them to start preparing and declaring for what you want to do through them. You're going to bring the provision. You're going to bring kings and priests together. You're going to use them as kings and priests. And you're going to show them when to open their mouth and when to shut their mouth. When to talk about Jesus and when to show Jesus with their life. So I just thank you, God, for this new hybrid that you're raising in this room. And this is a historical meeting. This is a historical moment in the life of this fellowship in America and around the world. And God, the fire that you've begun here in every person tonight, I pray as they go that they spread that fire in their homes, in their businesses, in their jobs, wherever they go, God, without even opening their mouth, somebody will look at them, just like they, the, Mario's wife said, what's happened to your face? Because they will see something new, something fresh, something powerful that they're going to want. Use them, I pray, for your glory. And, Father, for those who are going to receive prayer cloths, if you need a healing in your body right now, just raise your hands. Come up here if you need a healing in your bodies. Joseph, come bring, bring those prayer cloths. Cynthia, come up here. Cecilia, come up here. These are armor bearers and my wife. These are people that we trust, anointed, trusted people of God that have raised, that will pray for you. And Bring one of these prayer cloths.